Ultimate power. The eminence and shadow. Two sides of the same coin, coiling infinitely between each other, ever growing like the macrocosm of the universe, to clash spectacularly at the pinnacle of strength. So, this anime is kind of like that, I think. Anyway. A random woman takes a shower, then suddenly relives some kind of trauma before heading to school. Her name is Akane Nishino, and she puts on a mask to hide her feelings. This Chad drops his 392 million ton sack, disturbing Nishino. His name is Kagano, who on the surface is average in every way. Nishino doesn't like Kagano. The way he always looks through her rustles the Jimmy residing within her. She likes him less now because he forgot her name. Nishino does regular school activities while monologuing about how a stalker psychologically scarred her some time ago. Meanwhile, all Kagano wants is to get stronger. The melancholic tones of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata resonate through the school's sun-kissed hallways. It's quite dramatic. Nishino begins to head home late at night. However, her ride is jacked by thugs. Kagano's keen sense for drama picks up on the situation. The walk home is paved with anxiety and a big angry boy. Nishino gets scooped into a car, spotting Kagano's blank stare right before losing consciousness. Well, I guess it's abduction time again. And this guy is feisty. Kagano takes off probably one one hundredth of his training weights and dons his mask. Nishino is given a heinous flashback of her previous kidnapping as she is unceremoniously undressed. The chimes of doom usher in the arrival of a masked savior, the stylish thug slayer. He lives up to his name. The other hooligan is more formidable, revealing himself to be an ex-soldier. They duel as the slayer introduces his superior weaponry, the bar. He unveils his cool moves. His opponent is shook and is then turned into a Jackson Pollock painting. Nishino is set free and warned about walking home alone. Kagano is disappointed in his fight with the soldier, vowing to become more imminent and shadowy. Nishino narrates the resolution of her event, returning to school the next day to Kagano's daily nonsense. He got her name right and is finally making proper eye contact. I think she sort of figured out that he's been wearing a metaphorical mask too. Anyway, so Kagano just went off and got himself run over by a truck. In the after credits, he explains that his one passion is to become the strongest hero, someone who has the strength to not only survive against an army of armed soldiers, but also be able to face a nuclear bomb head on. And so, the decision to be Esekai'd by Truck-kun remained the only option to achieve absolute strength. Sometime after Kagano's resurrection, the first of his waifus named Alpha reveals that an evil association called the Cult of Diabolos is up to something dastardly. Kagano says some cool voice lines about sticking to the shadows, inspiring his follower. Whiplash back to the present, Minoru Kagano has perished, but the magic-filled story of this little aristocratic poop beast named Sid begins. Our protagonist's unrelenting commitment to being secretly powerful continues in his other life as his prodigious elder sister, Claire, explodes a rock. The two are expected to grow up to become dark knights, which gives him the perfect cover to gloriously slaughter bandits for pleasure and money. Sid Sid's slimy suit and sword make for a good mix of offense and defense. Nice. While reaping the spoils of battle, he finds a freaky blob creature on which he excitedly experiments with his magic. Three days later, it turns into a naked elf lady. He explains off the cuff that her ailment was caused by the evil demon Diablos, who cursed the heroes who defeated him by giving their descendants the gross meatball disease. She inquires about the perpetrator, receiving an impromptu answer involving the cult of Diablos, a group of nefarious people set on resurrection the ancient demon. He continues to ad-lib into existence, his mission to stop their evil schemes, at last introducing himself as Shadow, he who lurks in the shadows to hunt the shadows. His former meatball, child of the heroes, swears her unquestionable fealty to the man who saved her. She becomes a little bit too excited about Shadow's fictitious mission, already ideating furiously about the future. Shadow brushes her zealotry off by calling their new organization Shadow Garden and naming her Alpha. Three years later, Sid reflects on how simplistic the martial arts techniques of this world are. While sparring with his sister, he keeps his cover by intentionally falling into a river though. Claire is whisked away to prepare for her farewell party, after which she will depart to the Midgar Academy for Dark Knights in the capital. Oops she has suddenly disappeared. The members of Shadow Garden have already gone to find her though, revealing that the cult of Diablos has captured Claire for presumably being a descendant of the heroes. Sid reflects on his ad-lib from three years ago, briefly, while Beta ponders the location of the cult's hideout. Despite not knowing what's going on at all, Sid accidentally points out the exact location with his slime knife. Later, in jail, 
Claire remains composed in front of her captor until he mentions abducting Sid. She goes nuts, but is pacified. Viscount Grease, yes, that's his name, Heidi Hull, is under attack. Shadow's women are extremely dangerous. Grease gets played around with, but pops some Sudafed and goes berserk, escaping to the hallways. Meanwhile, Shadow is lost. Unfortunately, Greasy dribbles to his doom. Shadow is merciless in both his one-liners and swordsmanship. Grapes has a mental breakdown, recalling his past and guzzling all the beans. His his desperation is ineffective, however. The memories of his daughter, turned to meatball, emerge from his last breaths as he places his faith in shadow. Sid doesn't realize that Grace wasn't abandoned. Claire is returned safely, then departs to the capital. Sid's collection of terrifying women suddenly also decide to depart, giving him a slight shock. Two years later, on the train to the academy, Sid reflects on his comrades' farewell, citing their parting as a product of growing out of his childish games. He recalls how even in his past life, his peers abandoned their heroic dreams, conjuring a vivid image of his psychotic death by truck as a reminder that nothing will stop his pursuit of strength as the imminence in shadow. Seven months later, at the capital, Sid has found comfort as an average side character alongside his hand-picked friends, Skell and Poe. Today is a glorious day, for he must confess love to the most popular girl in school due to losing a bet. Sid is elated by this perfect background character event. It's Princess Alexia, whose suitors line up in droves to take their chance at the time of his reckoning, Sid plays the part immaculately, pathetically quivering in fear. Alexia accepts his request. Everyone is shook. Sid's delicate plans to maintain mediocrity have been mysteriously crushed. Alexia intimidates the plebs at lunch with her lavish meal, while Sid goes nuts on her food to begin Operation Get Dumped. She tries to get him to join her fencing class and indisputably succeeds. Later, Sid and Alexia spar. He finds that she actually kind of sucks at swordplay, but has honed the basics to mastery. Her much more capable sister, the most powerful dark knight in the kingdom, Iris, must have been the inspiration for her refined adequacy. After their bout, Alexia and the head honcho, Xenon-sama, politely argue about their betrothal. That evening, Sid tries to dump Alexia by confronting her about using him as a political shield, but is deflected by blackmail, which doesn't seem all that bad really. She insists that their relationship is only until Xenon gives up, producing a single twinkling of a gold coin. The musical clatter of its end packed with the floor is all Sid needs to remain an accomplice. Alexia is elated by his complete obedience. A montage of their controversial pairing ensues. Zebop is unenthused. Later, during an ice cream run, Sid inquires about Alexia's trouble with Xenon. She responds by stating that she straight up hates his existence, that flaws are how she judges people, and those that have none to show are the worst kind. Sid is complimented on his averageness, and the slut money keeps flowing. Weeks go by with no notable events. On the train, Alexia is frustrated by her lack of talent with the sword, stating that Sid's style infuriates her due to being exactly like her own. Sid confesses to the contrary, that he loves her fighting style. Alexia gets aggressive by his ardent defense of her skill. They sort of stare at each other for a while, then break up I think. The next day, Sid is arrested on suspicion of abducting the princess after her sudden disappearance. Somewhere in the sewers, Alexia awakens to the interior of a cage. Her roommate has the meatball disease, and her PCP is a freak with a fetish for blood. Despite being imprisoned and harvested, Alexia remains calm. Meanwhile, Sid is subjected to hierarchical brutality. He's elated by the opportunity to be pathetic, screaming out in artificial terror. The bloodletter is a little too excited about extracting Alexia's life juice. He has a mental breakdown after recalling the destruction of his old laboratory. Alexia feigns empathy. He takes out his frustrations on the meatball, then feeds Alexia some chunky goop. Iris and Xenon discuss the prince is kidnapping, but don't have any suspects other than Sid, who remains useless. Iris laments about her lack of personnel and is reassured by Zoro when Claire's brother complex begins to cause a ruckus outside the police station. She's detained while Iris reflects on her own love for her sibling and the ever-expanding emotional distance between them as they age. Sid is finally released from confinement and gets an enigmatic message from Alpha. She rendezvous with him at his room, reporting on Shadow Garden's growth since their parting. Sid is still clueless to the reality of his ad-libbed cult of Diablos. Alpha goes on to explain how Alexia was abducted by the cult and is likely being experimented on. She scolds Sid for not placing more trust in his organization, believing that he, in his omnipotence, is working on secretly dismantling the cult on his own, then yeets out a window. Meanwhile, Alexia doesn't look so good. Shadow prepares the perfect interior decorations for the upcoming drama. His diligent money-grubbing has yielded exceptional results, and he begins to wait for the
the messenger, it's Beta, who is understandably impressed with his dramatic poems and elegant aura. She informs Shadow about tonight's plans to root out the evil of Diablos from the capital while uncovering the location of Princess Alexia. Shadow interrupts by unfurling a mysterious letter and promptly taking over a subsection of the operation. Beta is impressed. Later, Sid is harassed by his torturers, whom he disembowels. Beta fervently scribbles notes, detailing Great Lord Shadow's splendor. Shadow Garden slaughter has begun as the Dark Knight's order deploys in a hasty response. Meanwhile, Alexia's phlebotomist goes feral by juicing the meatball with magic blood. He is instantly vaporized and the two prisoners get to escaping. Alexia stumbles into her betrothed, Xenon, who reveals himself as the mastermind. He wanted her blood so he could be promoted to a council of knights called Rounds, all of whom I suspect are probably Diablo's cultists. They exchange a couple of heated blows, but Alexia is easily defeated. Shadow finds the perfect opportunity to melodramatically intervene, introducing himself to the plebs. Xenon, unaware of the overwhelming disparity in his and Shadow's ability, challenges him to a duel, formally introducing himself as the future 12th seed of rounds, Xenon Griffey. The town is in a panic after Mega Meat, the desiccator, has emerged from the sewers. I'm getting some Attack on Titan vibes from this biz. Iris observes the chaos from the rooftops, initiates an effective attack, then takes over command. Meat Mountain regenerates, however. Iris responds by making a series of devastating blows, but is scolded by Alpha for making the monster suffer. Alpha spectacularly releases the cursed girl from her fleshy prison by executing a plunging attack. A locket falls out of the meatball's prison pocket, revealing her identity as Viscount Greasy's daughter. Iris is scolded once again, and heeded to remain an observer of Shadow Garden's battle. Meanwhile, Shadow plays around with Zebo, who is confident in his skills. Their fight is so painfully one-sided that Xenon appears to be like that of a child clashing with a master. Alexia observes Shadow's flawless display of swordsmanship, reflecting on how ordinary it appears, despite how refined. She recalls her own journey to find strength, tragedy of a fencing style, and inadequacy in comparison to her sister, all of which drove her to ceaselessly strive towards achieving a speckle of the majesty unfolding before her. Xenob is artistically laid low before Shadow Garden. Alexia is confused. Xenon eats a million magical pseudofeds, metamorphosing into an awakened being. His new powers are ineffective. Shadow delivers some killer one-liners while using his various appendages, ultimately activating his own magic, all purple-like and hued into pure control of the power. He monologues about his old self, wanting to survive an atomic bomb, and deciding that to do so, he must become stronger than nuclear. Xenon wants none of that, breaking his sword on Shadow's radiant mantle and tasting the full force of his special move with the hushed muttering, I am atomic. Shadow accidentally annihilates like 1 20th of the capital in a gratuitous purple explosion which is seen by various main characters. Alexia is shook, giving her mediocre sword style a couple of swings. Iris and her reunite as things return to normalcy. She and Sid go over the events of these past couple days behind a shed. Alexia eventually gets around to thanking him for complimenting her fighting style, stating that she has found a new inspiration for the art. She also tries to flirt, but is immediately rejected. Sid actually almost dies as a result. The women of Shadow Garden reminisce about the glory of Shadow's nuclear explosion while they continue their insanely complicated Illuminati business, presenting the next part of the story. Shadow Garden impersonators doing naughty things without permission. Iris reflects on her own suspicions with the Night Order, beginning the operations for establishing her own offshoot. She also reveals this thingy, which is some kind of powerful artifact being researched by a pink-haired nerd who falls head over heels for Sid right before the end of this episode and part one of season one of The Eminence in Shadow. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this dumb video, be sure to like and subscribe for more. I've got a Patreon if you feel like signing up for that also. Uh, that's it I think. Thanks again. Bye.